few people coming in after we start here, but I, we, we're already a few minutes past the hour of 6.30, so why don't we begin. We're going to today talk about uh, organic farming and food, and also about genetic engineering. And again, those are two topics on which there isn't general agreement in the population generally about the goodness or the badness of them, and uh, we'll talk about it. It's not they aren't necessarily black and white issues, and you, we can't decide them as easily as it might uh, seem, and that will be true, uh, especially uh, for genetic engineering. Come on in. And then even more true when we get to uh, the topic on Friday. And remember, the topic on Friday is stem cells. That is a relatively sh brief lecture because it's a, a simple, actually a simple topic to talk about. It's just that, well, just to sort of tell, give the end of the story at the beginning, it involves abortion. And different people have different feelings about abortion. And when something is, when it's ceasing of the life of an unborn child is considered abortion and when it's not. So we'll, we'll uh, uh, do that. It doesn't take long to talk about the issue, uh, but the last day of class, maybe we'll end a little early. So what we're talking about it, uh, today, again, is organic farming and food. The important thing to remember when we talk about those issues is that they really are two separate things. Organic farming and organic food are two separate topics of discussion. Organic farming concentrates on sustainability and uh, of, the, of the farmland, of the soil, and how well you can do that. How well can you farm such, as, su such uh, that you are essentially leaving the land as the same as you started when, uh, when you began the farming? And that's, that's the farming part of it. That's organic farming. Uh, without, well, I'll cover that in more detail in a moment. But, but then, then there's the issue of organic food. And the question is, when you farm that way, do you actually make food that tastes better, that is better in some way or another? And um, that's uh, a separate matter and not quite so easy to decide, partly because it's a, a subjective uh, issue when you, when you talk to people about how good something tastes, uh, that's not an easy matter to decide because different people seem to have different taste buds when it comes to good and bad and, and indifferent. So we'll see what I'm talking about when we get to that. But again, just for the, the, the big issue uh, around that whole topic is that we're really talking about two separate things. It's not one issue. Organic farming, organic food, two separate issues for, for particular reasons. So uh, with, let's start with organic farming. And in fact, we'll spend most of our time on organic farming because there we can talk about some, we can talk about specifics. It's not so easy with uh, organic food. So the question is, is, is organic farming better than, uh, than non-organic farming? There are lots of people who say yes, absolutely, no doubt about it, organic farming is the way to farm. And the reason that they say that is are the ones that I just gave you. And that is that there's a concentration on sustainability. Are, are we leaving the soil in the same circumstance, the same state of affairs as before we began that organic farming? Now, you, you might think to yourself, well, that's impossible. We're taking out so much uh, when we grow food and then we cart the food away and we use the food someplace else. So how can that be the case? Well. It, in fact, probably it cannot be the case 100%, but it can come a lot closer uh, than you might think. So, those, uh, so there are people that say organic farming is much better for those reasons. But there's an important thing to remember about organic farming, at least as of today. And that is that the production, how much you can, how much food you can get per acre is a lot less with organic farming than with the with what have become the traditional methods of farming. Uh, that is to say, 
a lot less than if you use chemical fertilizers, if you use pesticides, if you use uh, farming uh, uh, tactics that have been invented by, by humans. So all of that makes, the, uh, uh, makes for a lower production. Uh, the fact that you're, uh, uh, that you're able to use all of those things when you're not doing organic farming. So there, it is an issue. And um, more and more, the side of that issue that's winning is the side that says we should really, sustainability is important. And so organic farming is better. We've got the, there's the problem with organic farming, and that is that it doesn't produce enough. Now, this is especially important in countries that have only so much land, and, uh, and they've got so many people that they've got to feed. And so that's a difficult uh, problem, and they've got hard, that countries like that have hard decisions uh, to make. One way uh, that one can, uh, that we could, that a class like this can study this is to go to an organic farm and talk about uh, what, what, what goes on on that organic farm. The interesting thing about organic foods and organic farming is that there was uh, a long time when there were no definitions. There, there were no clear definitions. And so anybody could say, this is organic food, and it comes, and we, I'm able to bring it to you and sell it to you because I have used organic farming methods. But there were no good definitions for organic farming. And so in the US, in any mm -hmm. event, uh, the U U.S. Department of Agriculture got into the act, and they said, we've, re we've really got to define what we mean when we say organic farming and organic food. And, s and like governments all over, I'm sure, we suddenly had a book full of rules and regulations that would define whether or not it was truly organic farming. But at least there were definitions, and people knew what it was. So there is a smallish farm. It's about 300 acres. Right, happens to be right near um, the University of California, Davis, where, I'm, where I spend uh, most of my time. Uh, but uh, here, here's what we just talked about. Different, uh, you, can, you can decide on organic farming depending on your value system. And if you happen to live in a country that's uh, starving in, in many parts, uh, you might decide uh, down here, you might say, I don't care. I don't care what they say organic farming does. The fact is, I've got people that are starving. I've got to do something about these starving people. And, I, and I'm going to use non-organic ways of farming to produce as much food as I can per uh, per acre. Anyway, uh, the, the farm I'm talking about is, is an organic farm. It's owned by uh, a man named Craig McNamara. And from a very young age, he has thought to himself, I really want to do something better in farming. I know quite a lot about farming, but I want to do something better than the way we've been doing it. And uh, he decided that he was going to farm the very best organic farm uh, that could be farmed. And he calls it Sierra Orchards. And uh, he also has quite a, 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 a going concern with regard to educating and teaching young people about what you have to do if you're really going to organic farm. Now, he puts all of the emphasis on sustainability. He does not talk about the food being a higher quality a higher quality with regard to taste, a higher quality with regard to uh, pro, uh, uh, vitamins, or any way you want to measure higher quality. And that is because he has not been able to, to, to define ways that uh, would make his food better than um, food grown in other, in other methods. So he puts the emphasis on sustainability and being able to farm the land without uh, destroying the land or without de degrading uh, the land. I'm just going to say a few more words about that because, uh, again, 
when you farm, you take things and cart them somewhere else, and you leave the land. But there are certain things that you can do that uh, take all of those things that are being taken out of the soil and puts them back in. Now, one big thing is nitrogen. Nitrogen, single most important thing, if you can define importance, probably can't, but anyway, it's uh, very important to get nitrogen back in the soil. But in addition, there's phosphorus and there's potassium and other major ingredients that are taken out when you cart away that, uh, that food and uh, those crops. So how do you put those back in? Well, with regard to the nitrogen is the one that can be done in a very natural way because there are certain plants that are capable of getting at that, um, uh, get, adding more nitrogen because they can do what is called fix nitrogen. They, they are capable of fixing nitrogen. That, that means that we, they can take nitrogen out of the air and incorporate it into the growth of the plant. That is a very uh, important tactic on the part of the plant. It doesn't have to depend on what it gets from the soil because it can get nitrogen out of the, uh, out of the atmosphere. What's our, what's, what's the concentration of nitrogen in the atmosphere again? Does anybody remember that off the top of their heads? 80%, 80%. So there's a lot of nitrogen out there to be had, but not very many organisms can use it. So it's just there uh, not being used by most, or, most organisms. But there are some, there are actually bacteria that can grab that nitrogen and incorporate it into protein. Furthermore, there are plants that, have, that enter into these cooper cooperations or co cooperative activities with the bacteria. So they give the bacteria a home. Soybeans is a good example. It's a plant you all know, soy. Uh, soybeans, the bacteria will enter into the roots of the soybean and they will form what are called nodules. They look like little balls on the, on, the, uh, on the roots. And in those nodules, the bacteria are hard at work fixing nitrogen, taking nitrogen out of the air and incorporate, and then the nitrogen in turn gets used by the plant. So there's a cooperate, cooperative agreement going on there. The plant gives the, the bacterium a safe place to live and everything it needs to live, in return, the bacteria say, not a bad deal, I like what you're doing for me, I'm gonna do something for you, and what it does is it takes this nitrogen out of the, out of the air and, and, and gives it uh, to the plant. So, if you want to get more nitrogen into the soil, you, you every other year, let us say, or every third year, you plant a crop like soy that is capable of fixing nitrogen. And they fix nitrogen, and uh, then uh, it's, in, it, it's there, the, the roots are there. No matter what you do with the top part of the plant, whether it's clover or soybeans, the roots are still there, and they, uh, uh, the, the nodules are there to be incorporated into the soil. So nitrogen is added to the soil from the nitrogen that is in the air. Now, nitrogen isn't the only thing that gets taken out, and so you have to think about other ways as well, and we'll come to those as we talk about this smallish farm, about 300 acres total, and the things that they do on this, uh, on this uh, farm. And again, the emphasis by this farmer, by Craig McNamara, is um, on this definition of, of uh, organic farming, and that is it's sustainable agriculture or sustainable farming. And that is defined as a food system that emphasizes healthy people, healthy planets, but it has to be healthy profit also. Otherwise, the farmer couldn't stay in business. I don't know uh, how this works in Taiwan, but in America there is this very unusual phenomenon, and that is that people highly value organically grown food. They believe it tastes better, and they have lots of other reasons for using it uh, as, as, as well. And so that food, if the farmer can meet the definition 
in that book that the, that the U, U, U.S. Department of Agriculture has put on organic farming, that, uh, that food is sold for up to twice as much dollars, money, per a unit as uh, non-organic. So, it, so it's very profitable. And there's an interesting, I remember uh, sometime back when we were first talking about this, and I was talking to a, a farmer, not this farmer, about organic farming, and he was just getting into it. And I, we were talking about what it meant. You know, what does the sustainability and organic mean? And, and are the foods really better for you? And he said, I don't know if, they're, uh, if organic food is really better for you or not. But what I do know is that people are willing to pay twice as much for it. So I'm going, I'm going to become an organic farmer. And that's, uh, and that's why. It's a very profitable thing to do. Now, you, can't, you have to abide by certain restrictions, to be sure. But it's a very profitable thing uh, uh, to do. Let me see how I got mixed up here. OK, if you go to this farm, which is about 20 miles from the University of California at Davis, and by now it's one of the more famous organic farms in uh, the US, the, the most famous ones are in California, uh, you find a variety of crops. There are different kinds of, uh, uh, of crops. And, and these crops can be moved from place to place. That's good. So maybe you grow sunflowers here this year, but you move over and you go to the other end of the property the following year. And that's, that's good because different plants take different things out of the soil. So you don't have the same continuous drain year after year after year. Now, unfortunately, this is not what happens in most of America. For example, in the middle, uh, in middle America, in the plains, in the prairies of middle America, it uh, has been for a long time predominantly corn, 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 year after year after year. And so that soil is being depleted. And the, re and the way it's uh, uh, put back right, or the way it's, uh, the fertilizer level is put to a higher level each year, is by adding uh, chemical fertilizers. These, th these are way, th that's not as bad as it's made to sound by lots of people. It simply means that you pick compounds that are high in nitrogen like ammonium nitrate. And there are probably a few chemists in here that know that ammonium nitrate has a lot of nitrogen in it. The, the ammonium has nitrogen in it, and the nitrate has nitrogen in it. So that's the kind of thing that's used for, fer for uh, uh, fertilizer. There are other things that can be done. Another kind of crop on this land is orchards. And in the orchards, if you drive around in California, usually, the, or, the floor of the orchards, the, the, the surface of the orchard uh, property is bare. And that's because the farmer thinks, I don't want anything growing on that land that's going to take away nutrients from the trees, from the orchard, from the trees of the orchard. And so I am going to uh, uh, keep that land bare. That's what usually happens. The organic farmer says, no, I'm not going to do it that way because I don't like the fact that you have to use pesticides to keep the land bare. Um, rather, I'm going to put a cover crop there, like this grass, in the orchard, and then let the uh, sheep come in, eat the grass. I can utilize what the sheep, the, 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 the sheep themselves as a, quote, quote, crop. And also, the sheep will uh, convert a lot of that grass to fertilizer. So organic farming uses technology techniques like this. They're natural, and uh, they make for ways in which you can make better use of, of, of the land. Here's another way. Um, there's a, there, there was a woman who said, you know, I have, uh, she worked in, uh, for, when she was putting herself through school, she worked in restaurants high-end restaurants, expensive restaurants in San Francisco. And she didn't know, she hadn't quantified it, but she had a notion that a lot of food was getting thrown away. So finally she, got, she ended up in the university as a professor. And she began to measure how much, of, how much food that was ordered in a restaurant got thrown away. 
and she determined that 52% of the food that went onto the plates stayed on the plates and got thrown into the garbage. That's a large fraction of the total. She said it's crazy that that food, for the most part, is going into landfills. I don't know, in Taiwan, you have landfills. Do you know what I mean by that? You, do, you, you have those. So it's where the garbage goes. And uh, fr uh, food uh, leftovers could end up in the landfill. She said, that's crazy. These are all organic compounds. And why don't we save those? So she began to develop a method, first of all, of collecting the, uh, the, the food from, instead of letting the restaurants throw the food into the garbage, she figured out a way to inexpensively collect that so that the garbage, the, the food part of the garbage, all came to the university. And at the university, she had ways in which she could convert that, that food into uh, the compost that looks like, like this. Now, compost piles or compost heaps are very common. Uh, people that have garden, backyard gardens, they usually have ways in which they can throw all of their organic materials into the compost heap and the, or pile. And, and, and it will eventually be very good fertilizer. Uh, so that's another thing that the organic farm does. It, it uh, makes its compost, and that compost is filled with materials that would replenish, uh, the, replenish the soil. Uh, here's another tactic, and, that, and it's, as it says here, no tillage. That means the, the ground is not plowed. There are certain negative things that can happen when you plow the soil year after year after year. So in this case, it's not, uh, it's not plowed. Uh, I think we've mentioned in the past uh, integrated pest management, IPM. No, we actually mentioned pher pheromones. Uh, the way uh, pests, pest insects especially, are dealt with is in ways that, are, that don't need pesticides, chemical pesticides that actually kill the insects. Instead, they use tactics that will use pheromones so that the, the, um, either the male or the female will think they're headed toward mating, but they're not headed toward mating, they're headed toward traps like, uh, like this, and, they're, and they aren't, they're, therefore they're not able uh, to mate. So these kinds of integrated pest management te technologies that don't use chemical pesticides are used. So that's another important aspect of organic farming. Uh, the conservation techniques include uh, ir uh, drip irrigation. This is where the, the minimum amount of water is used. In California, in fact, a lot of water is needed if you're going to farm well. So the idea is to make the best possible use of that of that water, and there are several techniques to do that. And one of them is this sort of buried drip uh, irrigation. Little tiny amounts of the minimum amount of water that's needed to keep the, uh, the crop healthy. Uh, it's a different thing than we're used to seeing, and in fact still see for most of agriculture in California, where these big spray machines uh, uh, throw lots of water onto the land. A lot of that water drains off and carries with it anything that might be soluble in the water. Uh, and that's the way it's normally done. What the organic farmer does is use ways of irrigating so that that water isn't lost, that it doesn't carry with it all of the harmful things that it could carry with it. It stays where it's put and supplies water to, uh, to the plants. Uh, these are some other things that have to do with water use, uh, sedimentation traps, tailwater ponds. Essentially what, this, what these techno techniques are, are ways not to lose the water to the river, so to speak. It doesn't just flow away and go into the river and out to the, out to the ocean. Is this, did I just lose this or is it it's okay? Um, so that's, uh, there are those kinds of uh, techniques and technologies that are used uh, also. Here's one that's interesting. The 
many of the crops require, uh, uh, in California agriculture, require the uh, pollination. The, remember we've talked about this, the, the carting of pollen from one plant to, uh, to another. And uh, there are ways in which you can do this. You can encourage those pollinators. They aren't always bees. They're oftentimes different kinds of uh, insects. And in fact, they can even be bats. Uh, bats are, are, are common pollinators. So you encourage them by using hedgerows. Hedgerows is just instead of using a fence, you plant rows of plants, rows of plants. And those plants in the past have been anything. They haven't necessarily been chosen carefully, the kinds of plants that went in there. Now, the kinds of plants that go in there are more often chosen to attract the pollinators that you need for your crops. So, uh, so how you choose uh, the hedgerows? This is just a, a solar panel uh, that, that captures some of the sunlight's energy in a different way uh, than, uh, than, than normal. Here again, uh, the water. Uh, an organic farmer wants everything to be natural the way it was to begin with, and so the organic farmer would say, we've got things on the land that really aren't there naturally. I don't know if they're good, and I don't know if they're bad, but I know that they're not what the land evolved with, and so let's take those out. We have lots of uh, invasive trees in California, and trees that were brought to California, like eucalyptus, for example. Eucalyptus is a very common tree in California. It's, it's, it's a native to Australia, and it was brought to California, and it thrived in California because the, er, everything that you needed was, um, uh, that the eucalyptus needed was there in California, but it's not a native. So uh, people now are thinking, we don't know. We don't know about the eucalyptus tree. It might be, it might be, uh, it might be good and it might be bad, but what we know is that it's not natural. And so they, they are working all over California to figure out ways to take the uh, eucalyptus tree out. And uh, that's another thing that the organic farmer, the really serious organic farmer, will deal with his or her property. Uh, streams in California have been straightened over and over and over again just to make them easier to deal with. Instead of meandering streams and rivers, they are um, uh, they're made straight, and that too is another thing that the farmer is trying to uh, trying to uh, correct. Uh, this is a, an important thing that hard, that occurs on only rarely in the case of organic farms, and that is uh, that the uh, in this in this case this farmer tries to educate tomorrow's farmers. Uh, in this particular way by teaching them, having courses on the organic farm that would teach them th these various technologies and techniques. So that's organic farming. And again, uh, organic farming is not the one that's controversial. I'm not going to say much more about food because there's not much to say about it. Except that without objective criteria, people uh, in the United States are increasingly turning to organic foods. And they're deciding that those organic foods are good for them, and they'll eat those, those organic foods. But if you are in science, and you say to, to one of these people, well, how do you know they're better? What's better about them? There are, there are, there's very little data that, that seems to uh, uh, pertain. One thing that's been found, for example, is that Tomatoes that are grown organically are more likely to have antioxidants. And then you may not know that word, and you don't have to learn that word, but it's considered to be a good thing. If a, if a, plant, if a plant is high in antioxidants, that's considered to be healthy, and there are good things that antioxidants do. Uh, and, but that's, you know, that's trivial in the whole scheme of things. And so to find proof that uh, organic food is better for you is very difficult. Now, there are lots of people that, that will say, well, uh, the fact is that you have not tasted a tomato that is as good as an organic, gr organically grown tomato. 
or a strawberry or any number of things. And so they will swear by organically grown based on their, what their taste buds are telling them. That's fine. And, uh, and, and, but it's not, you can't measure it. And what tastes really good to one person doesn't actually taste that good to another. And so, uh, and so it's a subjective measure. Now remember some time ago, I, I mentioned that within the realm of making these kinds of judgments, it, the fact is that there are some judgments that we make that are faith-based. And by that, I do not mean religious-based. I mean we simply believe it whether or not we have the scientific evidence. And this is one of those things. There are people that will swear that the organically grown strawberries taste much better than the strawberries that are not organically grown. But you can't measure it. You can believe them, and they can believe themselves, but you can't measure it. And that's what I mean by faith-based decisions. We make decisions that are not based on scientific fact. We just know it and we believe it. So uh, that's organic farming and organic foods. Not much to say about organic foods, but certainly a lot to say about organic uh, farming. Remember, though, that organic farming has its difficulty as well. And what was that difficulty? What's the difficulty with organic farming? Do you remember what I said right at the beginning? Organic farming. What's the problem with organic farming? Does anybody remember what it might be? Yeah. Exactly. Organic farming is not as productive. So you can't produce as much food per acre as you can with inorganic farming. And for some people, that is, I can't remember if I mentioned it before, but that is certainly the case in China. In, main, in mainland China. They are very worried about being able to produce enough food for the, for the hundreds and hundreds of millions of people that they have. And so doing everything organically is not terribly appealing to them. They don't see how in the long run that's going to feed the people uh, that, have to be, that have to be fed. So uh, that's, that's a problem with organic farming. But as I've just described, there are so many things. There are lots of other things that are very good about organic farming. So as we get better at organic farming, it probably will become more and more popular. It definitely is a, it's better at sustainability. It's better at, at uh, sustaining the land in the same form that it was when we started to farm it. OK, now I'm going to go on to genetic engineering, but we're at a good place to uh, take a break. And what were we going to, are we going to wait till after the break? After, OK, so after the break, we will talk about the, one of the last uh, quizzes, unless there are any questions. OK, take a break, and uh, we'll be talking about, uh, it's quiz five. We'll talk about quiz five when you come back begin and I'm going to try and get through this rather quickly because I'm feeling guilty about starting. I just counted the heads. There, are thir there were 13 of you who had your head on the desk kind of sleeping. You're, this is exam week or at least some of you have some exams or something uh, like that and uh, you're probably spending late nights uh, studying. So I'm going to try and zip through this uh, fairly uh, quickly. Not so that you can go home and go to sleep, because you probably won't do that. You'll go home and study some more. But uh, let, let me, uh, I'm, I, so we're going to talk about genetic engineering. And again, this is a very controversial uh, topic. There are lots of people that feel very badly about uh, genetic uh, engineering. And uh, they feel it's just wrong. And again, you have to make your own decisions about whether genetic engineering is, uh, is OK uh, or not. The fact is that it's something that is growing in the, in the world because there are particular things that you can do with genetic engineering that you simply can't do with traditional uh, uh, hybridization. The, the, the growth of uh, organisms to get better characteristics. 
as we're going through this, I want you to remember one thing, and it's just the one thing that you really have to remember whenever you're talking about genetic engineering, and that is that every organism from bacteria through to whichever one you want, might want to identify as the most uh, 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 advanced of organisms, is the genes are made out of the same stuff, exactly the same stuff. It's the, D, it's the, it's the chemicals, the, the four uh, bases that make up DNA. Bacteria, humans, same stuff, same materials go into the DNA. So how is one organism so different than another? It's just rearranging. And I was trying to remember the name of the game and apparently uh, it's uh, Legos. You, you know Legos? You've heard of Legos? Uh, these are blocks that uh, kids can work with and uh, make various kinds of things. More and more, more than just kids work with Legos to make all kinds of things. The fact is that one person can start with the same set of Legos and make a small car, and another person can start with that same set of Legos and make a um, bicycle. Same Legos, different product. That's how it is with DNA. You can take the same DNA, the same compounds that go into making DNA, and make different things. And that's why you have different genes. Different genes in humans than you have in bacteria, and so on and so forth. So just remember that, because I, it's not clear that most people in the world know that genes are made out of the same stuff. Whether you're talking about a bird, or a gorilla. The genes are made out of the same out of the same stuff and it seems to be confusing for some people and we'll get to uh, what I think is the best indicator that that's the case. Now where is it? We're going to go back to this for a brief moment. Remember this is this is these are uh, sometimes called Darwin's finches or Galapagos finches. And Darwin saw this uh, array of finches, different kinds, different sizes, and uh, for a long time uh, that it didn't, he didn't understand why he, that was looking familiar to him until eventually um, he realized that it's the same kind of variation that you can get when you're breeding horses or you're breeding apples or, um, or whatever you happen to be uh, breeding. And this all has happened by traditional breeding. Traditional meaning you want a faster horse, you take a fast male, and you breed it with a fast female, and if things work out right, you get a faster colt, a faster horse. Now, the problem with that is that um, you, when you put those, that male together with that female, you not only get the genes that are necessary for speed, you get all of the genes of both mixed together. And so it's kind of a crapshoot, as they say in uh, some places, maybe not Taiwan, but it's, you don't know for sure how it's going to turn out. Sometimes that breeding works uh, just fine and you end up with a faster horse, but it's not necessarily going to uh, be that way. So you can have um, a problem with corn, for example, and you can have some corn that really gets diseased badly. You can take that corn, you can take the corn, the corn that seems not to be badly affected, and you can breed it with other corn that seems not to get badly infected, and you can end up with corn that's relatively healthy. That's traditional breeding, but especially in this, I chose this particular disease because these, uh, it can happen that without expecting it, you can get a negative gene in the mix. And once more, there was a, a year that goes back a long time now, it's in the 70s sometime, the early 70s as a matter of fact, when all of the sudden, all of the corn was susceptible to a, a disease that it never got before. And that's because in this traditional kind of breeding, something snuck in there, and it was something that was not even being considered when the corn was being breeded to get rid of this, uh, to get rid of this this disease. 
So we, let's come back to the horse for a brief uh, moment. Let us say, let us say that you could identify precisely the genes or the small groups of genes that accounted for muscle size in the legs, the length of the leg, and, and the capacity to absorb oxygen. If you could isolate just those genes and incorporate those genes into a new organism, you could have a faster horse without the risk of everything else that goes into horses in traditional breeding. That's what you would that, that's what you would hope to be able to do. Now it happens that in horse racing, which is very popular in most parts of the world, uh, the entire university, uh, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, was built with money from the Jockey Club uh, of Hong Kong. So it, money comes available because of horse racing. But in, in any event, you, here's what you, you could get. Um, sorry, you could get a uh, a very specific kind of add-in to speed. Now. And that hasn't always been the case. Horses today, the fastest horses on a racetrack, are very susceptible to leg breaks. And there have been some traumatic, heartbreaking uh, examples of this, where horses were doing just fine, and they seemed to be maybe the fastest horses on the face of the earth, and they would break a leg. And when a, when a horse breaks a leg, you've got a big problem. They usually can't recover. Uh, from it because they they will not tolerate a cast on a leg and it's very very difficult to uh, to heal and they get uh, splints we all get shin splints where our shin is sore but we don't know exactly why and it's usually a shin splint it's not a broken shin but it's uh, this part of the this bone down here it's not a broken shin but it's uh, something where you have a minor injury now here's uh, perhaps the most uh, important example in today's work because it demonstrates what you can do and it also demonstrates what people are frightened of, what people are afraid about. This rice here is called golden rice. And it came about when two workers, Patricus and Bayer, these two workers said, if you look at the distribution in the world, of people who have vitamin A deficiency and therefore have problems with their vision, here's how it looks on a map, number one. Number two, if you look at the people in the world who have rice as a staple in their diet, here's what it looks like on the map. And there's a lot of overlap between those two uh, areas. So what they said was, why don't we figure out a way to put Vitamin A, it's actually the precursor to vitamin A, why don't we put that into rice? Nothing else, just that into rice. And then people who eat rice will be able to make vitamin A and they won't have the vision problems that they're having today. Large parts of India, for example, are affected by this problem. So that's how it came to be that golden rice was made. And so they were able to do it. They inserted they had to insert genes from two different organisms, one from another plant, not rice, but another plant, the daffodil, and one from the, a, a soil bacterium, a bacteria that normally grows in the soil. So they isolated these genes from those two organisms, and they put them into rice, and, and lo and behold, rice was then able to make vitamin A. That is, was a good thing. But people worry that these genes being incorporated from other organisms into rice was somehow unnatural. And in fact, it was unnatural. But again, I ask you to remember that all DNA is made out of the same stuff. It's just arranged differently to make different uh, genes. I'm going to skip the next slide. So there's, there are large parts of the earth. Uh, people in Germany, for example. More and more recently, people in India that are afraid of these 
uh, plants that have genes that are not their own naturally. And so that's, uh, this actually is from the literature of one of these uh, uh, very strong and influential groups of people. And so people began to call these foods frankenfoods. Frankenfoods after Frankenstein uh, the monster. And, uh, and, and, and this again is, uh, th this is this, it's not just made up for this talk. This is a, uh, uh, from an ad for, uh, put out by people that are against genetic engineering. And, and so in Germany, large parts of the whole area of genetic engineering are not able to take to part to uh, take place in Germany. And furthermore, foods that are the product of these uh, of the of this kind of work are not allowed in Germany. So so back to the golden rice. Where is it today in the whole scheme of things? It is still not released, even though there are literally millions and millions of people that are vitamin A deficient. They're vitamin A deficient and if they had golden rice, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be. The good thing about the way golden rice was made is that nothing is changed except that these new few genes are inserted to make the precursor to vitamin A so that these people who eat it can make vitamin A. So the, the, the consistency, the feel, the taste of the rice, it's all the same. That is not changed at all. So the people can't tell the difference in the rice. Uh, but, but they're frightened of it because, again, there are genes that come not only from another plant, but from a bacteria. And so they refer to this food as Franken food. Um, now, uh, there are lots of examples of the use of genetic engineering that, has, that, that really has served us. But that doesn't mean, and I'm going to give you a few, but that doesn't mean that I'm arguing that we should all be, again, this can, that we should all be for uh, genetic engineering. This is one of those things that can come down to uh, a faith-based decision, not, and faith, again, not related to religion but you just believe it because you think some things are right and some things are wrong and there's and it's easy to tell the difference and so uh, it is not I'm not arguing that this is necessarily the right way I'm just trying to make it clear what the facts of the matter are uh, here's a case where genetic engineering is used for uh, to deal with the problems of diabetes we always had a difficulty in dealing with diabetes because Insulin was very expensive, and especially poor people couldn't afford insulin. And it wasn't until it wasn't until uh, a way was uh, determined and figured out to make insulin in a different way uh, than had been done in the past. In fact, this insulin, the insulin that we're using today, is almost entirely made by bacteria. Bacteria make the insulin. Do bacteria have the genes to make insulin? No. Bacteria, uh, the only way that bacteria, I should have said, do they naturally have the genes to make uh, insulin? And the answer is no. The only way they can make insulin is because the, the genes for insulin are inserted into the bacteria, and the bacteria are grown in huge vats, and they make the insulin, and we then harvest the insulin and make the insulin available to people who need it because they are suffering from uh, the, the uh, difficulties of not having sufficiently high uh, 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 insulin in their system. Here's that, so that's one example. That is clearly genetic engineering. Here's another example. There are some plants that are, let me start differently, there are some pest, pesticides, and this is a man-made pesticide, and you might have a difficulty with that, uh, and uh, again, it's, it would be a, a faith-based uh, kind of decision, that, uh, that die when they are exposed to, um, in this case we're talking about glyphosate, Glyphosate. The common name for glyphosate is Roundup, 
And glyphosate kills every plant that it comes in contact with. It's a very potent killer. It's very good in other regards because you can take that um, pesticide and use it and, it, and it only lasts a short time in the soil. So it does what you want it to do. It kills plants that you want to be killed. And then it goes away because it's very rapidly degraded in the, in the soil. So it's good in that regard. But it's even better if you can develop a plant. Let's say you're growing soybeans, or you're growing corn, or you're growing anything. If you can take that crop plant and make it resistant to glyphosate, then you have that one, let's say soy again, soybeans, you have that one kind of plant that is resistant to glyphosate. So you can go out into your fields that might be hundreds of acres large, and you can indiscriminately spray glyphosate. Everything will die, and that's what you want. You want to kill the weeds, but, uh, but, but, your, but the, your crop plant, because you've genetically engineered your crop plant to be resistant to glyphosate. Now, there are certain things wrong about that. I mean, I don't like the idea of any chemical that seems to kill everything in its path. But when you're a farmer and you're wanting to go drip just corn and you don't want anything else to grow because you want corn to have access to everything that's in the soil, you kind of like this idea. Glyphosate is, for the whole, in the whole scheme of things, a very inexpensive way to kill all of the weeds. So that's another example of genetic engineering. It's probably the most common example. When people say, for example, that there are 80 countries in the world that use genetically engineered plants, this is usually what they're talking about. They're talking about these plants that are resistant, in fact, even specifically to, uh, uh, to, to uh, glyphosate. So genetic engineering can be um, very useful, and there are lots of examples that one uh, can give to make uh, this case. That is not to say that if somebody just believes for no scientific, measurable reason. If somebody just believes that it's not a good thing to take the genes from one organism and put them into another, I have no, nobody should have any difficulty with that. All, you ha all one has to understand is that that's a faith-based decision. It is not based on scientific evidence. It's a faith-based decision. And everybody has the right to faith-based decisions. As I've said before, most of us lead most of our lives based on faith-based uh, decisions. So this is nothing, nothing new. Uh, but I, again, as you make that, as you're trying to figure out whether you do or do not uh, put the OK, the, the OK stamp on genetically engineered uh, plants or, and animals, remember that all genes are, ex are identical. They are made out of the same stuff. It's just that that stuff is rearranged uh, differently to form different genes in different plants and different organisms. And that's why uh, gorillas are different than cardinals. That's all I'm going to talk about today. And I will see you on Wednesday. And we'll talk about stem cells on, on Wednesday. Again, a very controversial uh, topic. Uh, primarily because it has to do with abortion. So we'll uh, continue in this general area and talk about stem cells on Friday, and that'll be our last lecture. And I will miss all of you, uh, but I, I, I truly will. But uh, we'll get at that, uh, we'll, we'll do that final lecture on Friday. And we also have a quiz on Friday, as I recall, and that'll be our last uh, quiz as well. And any questions you have about the way the course is going to be graded or, uh, or any of that, uh, we can certainly talk about that on on Friday. So see you then. So long.